At the end of book nine, Aeneas has been away. He was trying to get allies from Evander and uh, Turnus has fought within the walls of the Trojan encampment and flees from the Trojans. And then we are taken outside of the perspective of Italy and we have a council of the gods. Now we've seen the similar kind of council of the gods in the Iliad before, right? And even at the opening of the Odyssey when Athena is begging uh, Zeus to interfere and allow Odysseus to return home. Now we have the Council of the Gods, only this is an interesting council because of the way that Zeus responds, or Jove or Jupiter responds. Um, whereas in previous councils, Jupiter makes these decrees that, okay, the Trojans are going to lose, they have to fall, it is fated, and we are going to have um, the Greeks win. That's not what we have in this council. Juno and Venus make their claims on both sides. Venus begs at least that Ascanius will remain unharmed so that Rome will continue. Juno still rages against Aeneas and uh, his insults to her beauty. And Jupiter says at the beginning, why do we have this problem? And then ends by saying, I'm not going to solve this problem. To no one's luck today, to no one's hope, will I show favor. Everyone must fashion hardship or triumph. Jupiter is neutral, the fates will find their way. Unlike other councils in which Zeus has declared or decreed or decided something, at this moment at least in book 10, and he will speak again at the end of book 12, but in book 10 he says, Jupiter is neutral, the fates will decide. Every person to themselves will fashion in their own lives hardship or triumph. Each side will get to make its own claims towards hardship or triumph. So there seems to be a lot more leeway here for the free will rather than the fate. So for the first nine books, we've seen so much emphasis on fate. And yet at this point we have each to their own will, uh, Jupiter remains neutral and the fates will decide what is next. So it's a really interesting, um, and if we, if we do the parallels as we've done before, one and seven arriving on the shores, um, two and eight carrying on the shield and carrying Anchises, um, and uh, three and nine we have the Trevels and the Adventures and um, Nisus and Euryllus and Turnus, and then four and ten then lying, lining up, we can ask ourselves whether Dido's misuse by Juno and Venus here, right, where she was a pawn, then did she fashion her own hardship out of this moment? Could she have made other choices than she did to throw herself on the pyre? Is that what is being suggested by Jupiter saying each person can fashion their own way um, and the fates will find their way to make things happen? It's a very interesting scene. So it's worth, worthy of conversation and reading over and over again. Pallas' death is reminiscent of Patroclus' death. Pallas is entering his first day of war. Aeneas and his group has landed on the shores only to discover this intense fighting going on and Pallas jumps into the fray. As he's fighting Turnus, he prays to Hercules. Hercules, of course, was the Greek hero who had fought and was well known and had become a god because of his heroics. He's a minor god and when he receives this prayer, he knows that he can't an intervene on Pallas' behalf, and this makes him quite sorrowful. And this is where Zeus responds. I keep doing Zeus. <laughs> Jove or Jupiter <laughs> responds. I think it's okay. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. Um, Jove responds and says, An end is set for everyone, for life is brief and cannot be recovered, but brave men through their exploits and strive for fame that last. This is the Kleos that was mentioned in the Iliad so often and which Hercules himself has actually benefited from uh, that even though there is an end, when you are brave, you are able to achieve Kleos or immortality. And this is one of the first instances that this really has been mentioned that you will have this everlasting fame. So we have a moment that is, that is meant to call up the death of Sarpedon who when he entered battle, he talked to Glaucus and said, we will go and fight for our fame or another's, but every end, every man dies. And so then when Sarpedon, who was most loved by Zeus, actually dies, 
um, he is comforted by the fact that everyone will have an end and he's not allowed to intervene even on behalf of a great son. And so here Jupiter is still passing on the same words that were said to him about Sarpedon now on behalf of Pallas as Pallas dies. Pallas' death does look very reminiscent of Patroclus in the same way that Patroclus was this young, um, gentle soul. It was constantly emphasized how gentle he was and his armor is stripped from him by Hector who is in a rage. In the Iliad it says that the spirit of Ares takes over Hector. Here Turnus strips the sword belt from the dead body. People know nothing of their fated future, the poet intervenes. Their exaltation cannot stay in bounds. The time would come when Turnus would give anything to not have touched the boy. He'd hate this plunder and hate this day. So the poet then kind of takes this omniscient perspective on the action of Turnus here and tells us this moment doomed Turnus. If what we saw just a second ago was the council of the gods that each fashion their own hardship, we have Turnus acting in a way that sealed his doom, even if the Latins were meant to be overtaken by the Romans. It did not necessitate that Turnus had to die at the hand of Aeneas, or at least that's what seems to be suggested here. Instead, by killing Pallas and not having mercy, and then taking his sword belt, later as we'll see, the sword belt will be what inspires Aeneas to actually kill Turnus and not show mercy either. We also get Diomedes <laughs> returns from a distance and we at least hear his voice. Of course, this recalls so much of the fate of those who conquered Troy. Yes, they won when they sacked Troy, but they behaved so poorly when they sacked Troy that none of them made it home safely. That Zeus, in order to compensate for the fact that Trojans suffered so much in the raising of Troy, he made each of them have these horrible fates that come out after they left. And so Agamemnon, of course, is brutally killed by his wife's suitor. And we have um, Menelaus takes seven or eight years to return home. So many of them lose time. Odysseus takes 10 years to return home. And Diomedes recalls this. It's a poignant moment for Aeneas and his men, even though they don't hear this letter, to be considering as they are sacking the Latins, not to be cursed in the same way that the Greeks were cursed when they defeated Troy. The defeated ones now becoming the conquerors need to remember from the lessons of the conquerors. And so Diomedes comes back and reminds, really he's speaking to the Latins, but he's reminding those who are listening to the problems with poorly sacking a city and not exhibiting mercy. Diomedes says, since Troy was overthrown, I have no quarrel with Trojans. I have fought Aeneas hand to hand, faced his cruel weapons, had Mount Ida's country bred two more like him. Troy could have visited on the Greek towns the morning meant for Troy. His emphasis on Aeneas's heroism is significant as well because we have to remember he was a defeated hero. Aeneas didn't succeed in the Trojan War. It was a 10-year battle and yet now he's the loser. And so in order for Aeneas to not look like the loser to the people listening, and they can see him as a respected father, you have to have words like this from your opponent even, saying, if there had only been two Aeneas, then they would have won. Um, if there had been more of Aeneas, <laughs> then, then Troy would have never fallen. And so we need to kind of hear, we've already heard divine words telling us how great Aeneas is. We've seen him be pious and merciful before. We've seen that people have heard about him, that there's decorations of his stories on Juno's temple. There's a lot of things that have solidified him as a strong figure, as the father of the founding of Rome. And now we have Diomedes, uh, a man who they didn't, he basically he lost to in battle <laughs> because he was taken away by Aphrodite in that moment when he was fighting with Diomedes. And Diomedes is even saying it is, it is hard to face Aeneas in battle. Um, he is a worthy opponent. So this is significant too, building up to the scene that's going to be between Turnus and Aeneas and recognizing that Aeneas's piety and his, does not negate his heroism. His heroism and his bravery in war is as strong as his piety. Book 11 is primarily dedicated to Camilla. There 
as a lot of scenes where people don't know how to fight her as a warrior and of course she is um, being stalked by one in particular as she is slaying all these different people. We do hear her referenced in the same way that Penthosilea was referenced earlier in Juno's temple as an Amazon and the poet steps back and praises her and says, how many did you unhorse um, who first and who last? And in the same way, this sounds like, um, where do I start my story, right? Odysseus talks about where do I start my story? What's first, what's last? What do I first tell you? And so in talking about the Aristea of Camilla, who do I first tell you that she killed? Who did she first unhorse? Um, her story is kind of worthy of that kind of epic language. Um, how can I tell you of how great her Aristea was? I'll try, but words wouldn't suit it. It's going to be, there's going to be so much that I could tell you. And yet also there's a tragedy of her death ends that too soon. Her death is quite interesting. Um, we do also get another goddess perspective. We have Diana the Virgin, parallel with Artemis from the Greek world. Diana says that, that she is one of the noble virgins, part of her party in a sense, and uh, will make sure that even though she can't save Camilla, so again, there are fates that are overruling the gods and the goddesses will, even though she can't save Camilla, she will make sure to kill whoever kills Camilla, right? So she sends one of her spies out to make sure that whoever kills Camilla, there's vengeance there. When Camilla dies, she lays down and speaks to one of her sisters and her last words are, don't let Turnus give up. Don't let this be the end. So I'm not sure whether this is suggesting kind of the toughness of these Latin people. Um, of course, she's not directly from Latium, but the toughness of these um, Italians that are there, the natives, right? We're constantly hearing how rough and sturdy and hardy they are and that we have even these women figures saying we're never going to give up. Um, even when we're defeated, we're undefeated. And kind of this mentality of, of bravery that extends beyond death and that continues to persist in the right way to go even as she is uh, losing her soul to Hades. Book 12 closes with Turnus' death. When I would teach the final scenes of the Aeneid, I would dress up for undergraduates in, you know, kind of the toga and laurel leaves on my head and tell them the stories and try to take them back to the world, right? To be guests at the table of Virgil. And one time I hired some undergraduate actors to play out the final scenes between Aeneas and Turnus because I, I feel as though it is fit for a stage. In the same way that following Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, we then have all the Greek tragedies where really the stage, the performative aspect of the work becomes more and more significant and attractive uh, to audiences. This poem, these final scenes, feel as though they could have been performed, right? The action is heightened and uh, you have Turnus's bravery, you have Juturna, um, his sister goddess stepping in and Juno is just unrelenting. She continues to, to rage and not want Aeneas to succeed here. And the fight between the two of them resembles so much the fight between Hector and Achilles. His spirit filled with unrelenting flame. So we hear the same language used of Turnus that was used of Dido and Juno. As on the plains of Punic Africa, again, we're hearing the language that reminds us of Dido, that hears the language that reminds us of the opposition. A lion wounded in the breast by hunters. Do you remember Dido being talked about as a deer who has been shot and doesn't know it? Relish is going into war at last, tosses his mane and snaps the planted spear, unflinching, roaring with his bloody mouth. So Turnus's savagery was set alight. The uncontained fury of the character. So Turnus is raging like Dido and like Juno before him, but just like Dido, he will be vanquished. He is a prey that has been shot and is continuing to fight um, to the death. Amata will hang herself, sadly. Um, this should remind us probably of Oedipus's uh, wife slash mother hanging herself off stage 
Lavinia tears her hair, scratches her face. Uh, Latinus then tears his clothes and mourns for the loss of his wife, and they don't know whether Turnus has died, but also mourning for Turnus. Turnus sounds like Hector. He has been chasing an apparition of Aeneas for a while, and he tells his sister, I did recognize you, I knew you were here, and I'm resolved now to fight Aeneas. You'll see no more dishonor in me. Grant me one more frenzy. This moment does sound like Hector who ran around the walls of Troy and then says, stops and says, I'm resolved to fight. Either he dies or I die, I'm, I'm going to fight. And Turnus says this too at this point, I will suffer anything, die. I mean, he really doesn't give an option of killing Aeneas, but I will suffer and die rather than keep um, chasing this apparition and moving away from the fight. Also, um, the moment will kind of be backwards because he will then run from Aeneas when he loses his sword. And that will make us again think of Hector running around the walls of Troy. But his resolve to fight happens before the run. So here we have Virgil again inverting things from our expectations. Jove himself held up a pair of scales evenly balanced for the pair of fates who was condemned. Same thing happened in the Iliad. We had Zeus holding onto the scales. Was it Hector? Was it Achilles? And yet everyone knows who is going to die. It has to be Hector and Achilles is going to kill him. We've already been told that. We already know that Aeneas is going to win over Turnus, and yet we see the divine sanction on this moment, right? Who, who is fated by the scales that are in his hand? Also in the last moments, when Turnus is about to die, he begs for his life. He calls upon the pity um, that Aeneas should feel for Turnus's father. He makes him think of Anchises. This parallels Priam, who called out to Achilles and said, don't you feel, can't you feel for Peleus, your father, um, in the same way that you should see that I feel for my sons? Don't you know the relationship between a father and a son, and can't that move you? Do you is that enough pathos for you to give me the body of Hector? And now we have Turnus using a very similar plea for pathos on the part of Aeneas, and Aeneas hesitates. We see his piety fighting against here the fate that he is supposed to take over this kingdom. Realistically, he should kill Turnus so that he doesn't have any further opposition in Latium, and at the same time, he wants to pity the man. It's only the sword belt of Pallas that keeps him from feeling that pity. He sees the sword belt in the same way that Achilles saw the, the armor on Hector, and it infuriates him. Aeneas then kills Turnus, and his piety seems to be overtaken by his fury. And that becomes a question <laughs> in this death scene. Is Aeneas's piety losing to his fury that he feels on behalf of his friend? Does he look more like Achilles here than he looks like Hector? Um, is this the kind of father of Rome that we would want to see or not? And that, of course, is a lingering question, and it's one of the reasons that the Aeneid remains a good book.